So. Okay. Uh, but we'll go through it pretty quick. We're, we're celebrating our 50th year, as you all know. And who knew the free press was going to last that long? Uh, it's amazing. And it's amazing. We were just talking to Adrian yesterday about how some issues that were issues back in the 70s just keep repeating every decade over and over again as we go through all the covers and look at all the, the different free presses. And we're trying not to be pessimistic or sad about it. It's just a lot of work that still needs to be done. So let me start this here. Bob, if you want to comment on any of these. <laughs> so are we officially started yeah, this lot. Seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll have to get through and if people got uh, comments, feel free to jump in. But uh, when we were going through these covers, there was a reoccurring uh, theme, police beat, police shoot, police falsely arrest gay people uh, uh, in the Dart League. Uh, so the free press itself, and uh, I've actually got an anthology called Cops Cover Up and Corruption, which is kind of, I think, the greatest hits of uh, a lot of police brutality in uh, Columbus. Oh, sorry. I got to start this over, but it's, there we go. Sorry. Let me start this over again. It wasn't letting me click on anything. Okay. Oh, screen sharing has failed to start. Steve, you think there's some problem? <coughs> Steve Caruso, are you still around? Hello, Steve. Hey, I'm here. Hey, it's not letting, not letting me share my screen anymore. Okay, let me go back in there. Hold on, give me a second. <sighs> working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, yeah, it totally. Are we sharing? Everything's great. Yeah, you're sharing now. Okay. But... Okay, uh, that, this is one of the legendary events. Uh, again, when Steve Conliffe pied Governor Rhodes uh, oh, yeah. in, in the aftermath of the uh, oh, yes. uh, Kent State shootings. Uh, the governor, under oath, of course, uh, uh, argued that he had been harmed greatly, uh, but you know, he was captured on film and by eyewitnesses uh, laughing uh, afterwards. Uh, Tremendous, you know, people like uh, it was Giddis and Sandy Spader, but uh, I believe uh, Giddis was one of the key attorneys who asked the governor uh, if he was lying then or lying now. But uh, great moments in free press history. Uh, and also years later, what anniversary was it? In, in 1990. In 1990, we also went down and pied the statue of Rhodes, which <laughs> was uh, thought to have the Kent State know, shootings oh, yeah. uh, in the briefcase. Uh, you what know, do you mean uh, the shootings? Uh, the headlines of the shootings uh, in the brief briefcase. People can't see your okay. face. Okay. So let me move over. Here's Margaret Sarver and Colin will recognize himself. I don't know if you can tell us who the other two people are, but these are some of the main free press staff. We'll go, quickly go through this. Roger Doyle was the uh, first. And, and Roger, of course, uh, uh, was most famous for sneaking in the wounded knee. Uh, the the only sort of reporter uh, when the Native uh, Americans uh, uh, seized uh, uh, the facility at Wounded Knee as Robert uh, Roger managed to get in. Uh, again, we could use Colin with uh, describing who is here's Margaret Sarber again, it's and so it nice. looks like Steve Abbott and uh, Roger Doyle. Yes, that Connie oh. Everett, and there they are again. Paul Connie Everett, Paul what? Volker. I don't know who Paul Volker. Down Here's the bottom our, left. Yeah. I'm told that this is how they uh, how they worked on the free press. It looks like fun sitting outside. <laughs> Steve Abbott, John Quigley, <laughs> all, <laughs> all former editors of the free press. And then here's their tenth anniversary. Every milestone anniversary has been celebrated in some way. We've had parties since we've been involved, and then this is 
this, today's our 50th anniversary party. And then inciting riot. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, uh, again, uh, t too bad uh, Colin can't talk about it because he was one of the inciters. Uh, <coughs> But again, we, we, we know that a couple of the insiders were actually uh, from an undercover Red Squad. Uh, again, when the, uh, uh, when the riots were occurring up on campus. But again- uh, The Free Press staff were arrested and they were charged with inciting riot just inciting for putting out the Free Press. Just like today when the, the Black Lives Matter uh, people are uh, overcharged. Uh, it was a way to try and uh, break the movement. And then here we are with this one. Yeah, we've already talked a little about that reoccurring theme. Energy. Uh, yeah, we have a long history of covering energy and covering it well. In fact, my first uh, investigative story in 1991 was essentially the Celeste administration uh, using its reputation uh, as being pro-environment uh, to try and uh, create the Zimmer plant, the coal burning power plant uh, that they just shut down. Okay, uh, okay there, uh, Cambodia, uh, tremendous stuff done there, but uh, uh, John Quigley, uh, who was in Vietnam, uh, looking at a variety of things uh, academically and for human rights, was taken by the Vietnamese government into, uh, they had captured it, Kampuchea, and uh, so quickly became the first Western journalist to report on the killing fields in Cambodia. John Quigley of the Columbus Free Press. Who was the editor of the Columbus Free Press. Talking about capitalism, the big box stores coming into town back in the 80s. So there's the... Uh, covering Central American issues. Yeah, tremendous uh, coverage of Central American uh, advocacy for the people. Illegal arms shipments. So we've done a long history, uh, again, uh, out at Rickenbacker Airport and elsewhere, Stop. drugs and arms have come in. Stop. Stop. Uh, <laughs> There's Ronald Reagan. Uh, warnings. <laughs> Where were guns and weapons going in 1981? Was that El Salvador and Nicaragua? Yeah, that was, uh, again, uh, the Contras uh, okay. under, under Reagan and uh, El Salvador uh, as well, but really the Contras. I just thought, I think that uh, the older covers are just so creative and artistic. I just love the headlines. I love the artwork on them. So now we're getting more into the, the late 80s. I think this might be when uh, Dwayne Jagger took over the paper another environmental cover. And there's Dwayne Jager, former editor, and they're the other yeah. side of the news t-shirts, Jennifer Bloomberg. <clears throat> and then now starting the era of Bob Petrakis being the publisher and uh, editor. Uh, again, a lot of the stuff I wrote for the free press, uh, I'm co-writing a, a book for Ohio State University Press. And a lot, we moved into a lot of uh, coverage, anti-Klan coverage. And I'm most proud of the fact that we put up posters of the eight leading Klan members in the state and drove all but one out of the state of Ohio. And that one we the went FBI, to his house. Yes, and we <laughs> went to his house. Uh, and of course, it got really crazy. Uh, Kelvin Reese in Coshocton, uh, because we introduced him to a lot of inner city youth. We actually took uh, two buses out there, one with black ministers, the other with local youth. Uh, who wanted to let him know that they knew where he lived. So uh, what today's today's analog of chasing the Klan out would be to chase out the uh, vigilantes. The well, we, boys, we, put up, we found out who their leaders were and we posted big posters in their neighborhood saying where they lived and where they worked and their neighbors took care of it. Okay, here, uh, the free press, of course, uh, some of you may know, was the first, uh, considered the first gay newspaper or pro-gay newspaper uh, in, uh, in Columbus. And up to 1991, we were the only uh, pro-gay newspaper uh, and we used to get grants and uh, we would uh, send them over to Stonewall Union like on lesbian health issues. Uh, this right here uh, is a classic. This is, uh, I believe when we were working with Charlie, was mm -hmm. it not? Yeah. Charlie and Lynn. 
So there it is, Lynn. And uh, uh, late, very late at night after, after Lynn would feed us and me and Charlie would be up at two or three in the morning, uh, we would finally uh, come to a cover, which usually turned out great. There's the smoking gun, right? The trash burning power plant. Uh, John <laughs> Bailey did a tremendous, did you want to say something, Lynn? Go ahead. Uh, John Bailey, uh, uh, this of course is the Ohio EPA. It was interesting, we went to a hearing they were holding and they demanded to know which one was which. They, they, were, they said they were like honored. Uh, one, one guy said, am I the guy with the twirling beanie hat? And we're like, <laughs> glad you're proud of this. Uh, uh, this is one of our famous uh, Star Trek uh, covers. Uh, Harvey and I, of course, uh, broke some major stories uh, on the Kent State shooting, uh, and uh, that was one of them. Uh, again, there's another Bailey cartoon. Uh, that's when uh, we the were talking side. about the South Side sacrifice zones uh, and environmental racism. Uh, we went out of printed business, uh, and we were brought back by Kenny Swikert and the Hep people from Rainbow Farms, and sadly, the people that owned Rainbow, Rainbow Farms were later shot to death in 2001. And we, ATF. <laughs> yeah, ATF and FBI shot them to death. There's the 30th anniversary, still smoking after 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> There's Beavis and Butthead of Battelle. Yeah, that's, of that's another thing. Yeah. Uh, 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 of course, uh, and Charlie and Lynn. Oh, uh, this is kind of out of order. But. This is a classic, classic, no, it's mid 90s, classic Biotti. Uh, we were, this is when we stopped <laughs> printing. Uh, so the question is, is this the last issue? You can see in the corner, uh, and you can see the forces, including Big Brother, the church and capitalists that were trying to drive a stake through our heart, but we came back. Not only did we came back, we became nationally and internationally known for our reporting on the 2004 uh, election. And started a book company. Uh, and we started a book company we got from Columbus Alive. Uh, Columbus Alive, uh, after 9-11, Harvey and I essentially were fired, but they uh, created a book company so I could still write and they would put it in books. It was called Columbus Alive Books. Uh, so ultimately, the Free Press now has a book company. And there, of course, is J. Kenneth Blackwell, co-chair of the Bush Cheney re-election campaign and well-known election thief. Uh, uh, and there, of course, the question, real news, real facts, real issues. Uh, uh, this is actually in 3D. This, yeah, is, uh, awesome. this is a Biotti. So if you got your 3D glasses and you look at the cover of the paper, you can see, of course, the eyes. Uh, but this is classic Jim Biotti, right? Uh, and uh, more recently, 2017. And of course, uh, our longstanding coverage uh, of the left uh, and socialist issues. Uh, and there, of course, uh, very appropriate to Adrian. And after the, after the uh, uh, guy, could. the kid in Cleveland, actually, yeah. they call yeah. him. Mayor Rice. Tamir, yeah. And uh, locally as well. And this is after the uh, Tiger King. Yeah. And this is after the um, kids were put in cages. So uh, covering and the down. And then finally, the attack on people who are trying to dissent, one of our more, more recent ones. So now we're gonna move into our Free Press Annual Awards Ceremony. And here is one of the only pictures anybody's been able to dig up of Libby Gregory, who our Libby Award is named after. And a real quick, quick brief bio of Libby is that she was the editor of the Free Press. Very, very, um, strong, assertive feminist woman who was very successful entrepreneur. She owned Tradewinds and the Free Press operated out of the Tradewinds store down there on campus. She owned uh, King Avenue Coffee House and the Zantium Bead uh, store. Uh, there was a lot of feminist um, and activism going on during those days that the Free Press was involved in and that she was involved in. And sadly, many think because of the Reagan breakup of the uh, 
what is it, the Traffic Controllers Union, there was an accident in California where a plane landed on top of another plane and sadly Libby was in that accident and killed in 1991. So we try to keep her spirit alive through our Libby oh, Award every year and give her award to somebody that we feel embodies a type of community activism that the free press um, is uh, very, very much in ab admiration of. So this year, we met our award winner, Adrian Hood. Yeah. And she had done her early voting last night. And we presented her with her free press plaque for the, this year's Libby Award for Community Activism. And there's Bob presenting her with the award yesterday. You can see the Franklin County Board of Elections in the background. It does look empty, but I think it was pretty close to when they were closing. There were a lot of people there yesterday. We'll talk about voting a little bit later. And uh, there's Adrian with her uh, son's picture on the front of her t-shirt, Justice for Henry Green, posing with her award. So we're gonna just give a, you a little bio about uh, Adrian right now to introduce her and uh, why we're giving her this award. Uh, Adrian, uh, a Columbus native, graduate of Columbus City Schools, uh, did active duty in the US Army, is still a member of the Air Force uh, Reserve. Uh, but really your perseverance when her uh, son Henry Green, uh, who I absolutely believe if he would have been uh, uh, white, he'd probably be uh, working in the Trump campaign today and threatening people with automatic weapons. Uh, when her son was shot by the notorious jump out boys, uh, a unit. Did uh, you say Henry Green would be working in the Trump no, campaign? No, 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 not yeah. Henry Green. <laughs> what, well, are you to... <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? The, uh, well, it wasn't Henry. Uh, the guys that shot him, mm -hmm. the cops that Zach shot Rosen Henry Green, Zach Jason Rosen. Bear. Yeah, or had he been white, had Henry Green been white, uh, he'd be alive in a Trump appointee, is the point I was trying to make. Why would Henry Green be a, a white? Him? If he was white, walking down the street with a gun is not a crime oh. if you're white. What you're uh, saying is there's a lot of white people walking around with Well, they're at the state capitol, right? They're threatening people. Yeah, and, but we don't uh, They're wanna... shooting people on okay. 270. We just don't want to put Henry Green in, <clears throat> in the same sentence. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying that. Uh, okay, just move on. Henry move Green, on. okay. I, I, get the, I get the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want people to get Maybe it. Maybe wasn't that He's only dead because of the color of his skin. If he was, Armed white people are worshipped in this country, right? right, right. right? They're Just the longest on. terrorist organization uh, uh, we've had are the white supremacist groups. So uh, with that in mind, uh, Adrian Hood has persevered. They've tried to sw uh, sweep it under the carpet. Uh, again, there's been uh, uh, legal decisions uh, that are monumental that are coming out of this. Uh, we won't talk about them in a great detail to the public record, but the whole question of police immunity uh, has come forward. But since Henry Green has was killed, they did uh, they did uh, disband the Jump Out Boys, the Summer Safety Initiative. Well, and, I don't know if they disbanded them uh, theoretically, but more like reorganized. Well, them. and I'm sure it kind of uh, still exists, but they've certainly shown a lot of light on what the police brutality issues have been. Adrian has been very involved in a lot of the, uh, the protesting and even more politically active than that as a board representative on the Franklin County Central Committee elected this year. So she's turning her, her anger, her, the tragedy into some type, type of very constructive activity. And we very much admire her and her work and we very much wanna celebrate Henry Green's life today as well as we honor her with the Free Press Libby Award. And there's a couple people here that are guests that we'd like to have them say a few words as they have had some uh, relationship and friendship with, with um, Adrian. We have Pranav. Johnny, are you here? Can you speak? Are you muted maybe? Yeah, hey, can, can people hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, congratulations, Adrian, for a well-deserved award. And, um, you know, as 
Uh, Bob asked me to come come and speak um, as someone who won the award a few years ago. And for me, like, I mean, it's just an honor to be, you know, in the same space I mentioned in the same breath. I don't I don't know how many of us here have have children, but I can't imagine my state if something like that, God forbid, happened to one of my kids to see your resilience, to see your um, not just advocacy, but righteous righteousness to go out there and to take leadership on these issues. And again, I'm looking from afar, but I can't tell you how much we've all been inspired by what you've done in this city and seeing the kind of leadership you've taken, the kind of inspiration that you've given to, to everyone. So I just wanted to say, um, this is so well reserved, deserved and congratulations. And um, you mean a lot to many of us uh, and, and, and just like, there's no words to, uh, to express that. Um, so thanks for giving me a chance to, chance to be part of this. Thank you, Prana. We really appreciate your words. And, and Joe Motil, he wanted to say a few words as well. Joe? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You can be a little louder. Okay. Uh, by the way, I did want to mention the picture of Libby. I'm almost 100% certain that's from the King Avenue coffee shop. I remember the black and white tiles on the floor. Yeah, I know. Pretty neat. Hey, first of all, I just want to congratulate and thanks. Uh, all the folks from the Columbus Free Press, both past and present, who have contributed uh, to providing people in the Columbus and Central Ohio for 50 years of much needed alternative news reporting. I think Columbus citizens in particular would have been left in the dark about, you know, much of the corruption that impacts our lives on a daily basis at the Columbus Free Press. And so I really want to thank everybody for everything. Uh, that kind of leads me into the decades of ongoing corruption and uh, lack of accountability and the need for police reform within our CPD, as we all know. And since just over four years ago, I think it's fair to say that Ms. Hood has been one of, if not the primary force in this movement. And her voice has undoubtedly finally gotten the attention of City Hall and the citizens of Columbus. Uh, her endless pursuit for justice of her son and others who've been murdered at the hands of police is proof that Adrian has no intention of giving up until sufficient police reform measures have been put into place and that those that murdered her son have been properly punished for their crime. And I doubt if anyone listening this evening can imagine the difficulty in fighting for years now that for justice for her son or for, for anybody's daughter or family member who was killed by the police, how difficult it's gotta be. And I, I know she relies very heavily on her faith in God uh, to get her through the tough days and to help her to continue her pursuit for justice and to educate people on politics of our elected officials. I'm sure many of you have probably seen some of Adrian's videos on Facebook where she's, you know, doing her best to get the word out there and get people to be educated about, you know, our politicians and what they stand for and what they don't stand for and what they're saying and what to believe in and what not to believe in. So appreciate that as well. And, and I know she has a, a lot of support too from her church, uh, True Love Ministries, and, and also from uh, the London Eagles that I know she's very involved with. So I, I'm not sure when or how or where I first met Adrian, but over the years, we've remained close in contact. And I consider her to be a very good friend and someone I'd do anything to help and support her any way possible. And I know that holds true for the people that are uh, here on the Zoom meeting today. Uh, there's no one more deserving of this award, especially when you're considering the events that are taking place here locally and nationally. And, just want to thank you, Adrian, for all that you've done and uh, continue to do for justice and for the people of Columbus. And it's an honor to, to be your friend and to know, and you should know, that we all have your back. And, uh, you know, we're going to be there for you no matter what. And congratulations. So thank you. Oh, that's that was wonderful, Joe. Thank you so much. And, and now, if it's not too much to put Adrian, Adrian on the spot, 
<laughs> you want to say anything now, Adrian? Show us your award. Absolutely. Let me show you that first. Yay! Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Um, so thank you, Pranav and Mr. Joe. Um, I really do appreciate um, your kind words and the encouragement. Um, I'm telling you, uh, I hear often that I encourage, you know, everyone else, but know that um, your thoughtfulness, your prayers, and y'all's encouragement um, absolutely helps me continue to be in this fight um, that I didn't pick, um, but nonetheless, I'm here. And um, I will continue to, you know, try and do everything that I can to um, to change things, um, not only for Columbus, but hopefully Columbus can uh, set the bar. And, um, and then it will be mirrored um, across this country, across the state, across the country. Um, like I said, it, it is, I, I never, ever, ever, um, would have imagined, um, that this is where my life would be. Um, I'm blessed, you know, to have met the people that I have met, but absolutely never, um, expected this to be a part of, uh, my story. Um, you know, as, uh, Ms. Susan said, um, I am military, have been in the military since 94, and um, I rule with a heart, an iron fist. Um, I have two sons, and I understood um, the strikes, you know, and the um, obstacles that would be against them from the beginning of their life. And those are conversations that we have always um, had. So never did I expect um, this to be a part of, of my journey. Um, but I will continue um, to fight. Uh, God has given me the strength to, to be in this fight um, and continues to give me the wisdom uh, to do what I, you know, what I'm doing. Um, I wish that we could be out um, so that I could give everyone a hug. <laughs> I'm a hugger. Instead of an elbow. <laughs> Mr. Joe would tell you that I'm a hugger. Um, so I'll air hug everyone. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just, you know, I, I want to encourage and remind everyone that we do have a prosecutor uh, race going on right now here in Columbus that, um, you know, we have the opportunity to be a part of history and get Ron O'Brien out of that office. Um, I, you know, and until we have a change there, uh, we will not have police officers here um, that are held accountable. And, and he, he stated that it's come out of his own mouth. Um, you know, even with the worst of cases that he's had, he still feels that they don't do anything wrong or at least nothing um, that he needs to be indicting them for, um, which is a problem. So um, again, you know, I could go on and on and on, but I just really um, am honored um, to receive the award. Um, I did have to do my uh, research <laughs> when uh, Ms. Libby, I'm like, oh my, who is this? Let me look and see. <laughs> what am I signing up for? Um, but I, I like the fact that um, she was a fighter, it sounds like uh, to me. And so she's good in, in my book um, because that is one thing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not bragging about, but I'm not afraid. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, because of that, um, I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to be in front of you. Um, I will continue to be out in the community. Um, we do a march every Monday in Linden, trying to uh, bring awareness to the violence in Linden to, to stop um, that violence as well. Um, but there is accountability that must be had, and I am here until I take my last breath to make sure that that happens for the citizens of Columbus. So I love you all. I appreciate, um, again, the kind words, and please, those of you that believe in prayer, please continue to pray for me and my family. Um, 
as we did get a victory, right? Um, the judge did rule in our favor, and that is something that has not happened before. So I see hope and prayer, prayers being answered. So we will continue to press forward together. Um, I hope I didn't go over my time. I don't know how much I had. <laughs> as long as you want. As long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know, we, you know, we're, we're in this together and, you know, the judge's decision, that is not just a decision for me and my family. That is truly a decision that is for our community, our community as a whole, not just black people, not just brown people. That is a win for our community. And as we continue to stick together, we will continue to move forward together. And I'm looking forward to that. So thank you. God bless everyone. Um, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And don't forget to get Ron O'Brien out. Yeah. 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 Um, well, we'll never forget Henry. We'll never forget yeah. his to say his name. And believe me that you are in our thoughts and prayers all the time. And just, just giving you all our strength to keep you strong. So... And you help keep us strong too. So thank you, thank you very much. For, Congratulations. Yes, everybody. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank People are saying, I don't know if you can see the, uh, the chat, but it's like so much of this progress is due to your work, Ms. Hood. Thank you. Congratulations. We, in order for your grace, courage, inspiration, and work, we are with you. Yeah. Somebody also wants to know if you have aspirations for city council. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go right for mayor. <laughs> so 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 fun. Run, Adrian, run. <laughs> funny thing about that, um, I actually was getting ready to pull a petition um, for city council, and we got the decision <laughs> from the judge. Wow. So um, unfortunately, at this time, um, I won't be able um, to run. But I do look forward to doing something in the near future. Oh, right. that is good news. Yes. So we'll see what it looks like. <laughs> uh, let me see. Congratulations. How about the news? So the Civilian Review Board, I can almost assure you, they won't select me for it. <laughs> I will, I will um, try. I am going to try and apply. Um, but I can almost assure you, as everything that has, um, you know, went forward since, uh, my son being killed, um, you know, the uh, the committees and things like that that they have put together, um, they won't let me in. <laughs> so um, I continue to push from the outside. Um, those that, you know, that are there, um, you know, just building relationships with them to let them know um, the things that uh, families like myself are expecting. Um, from those uh, committees and review boards. And so, um, you know, that that's kind of been my way of uh, making sure that my voice is heard um, still in those spaces that um, they just don't want me to be in. <laughs> well, at least you made it on the Central Committee. You can do some good there. I, I absolutely did. And um, that was quite a surprise um, <laughs> Excellent. to... Um, uh, the gentleman that I, that I was running against. Um, I mean, there were yard signs out here and, and everything, but m myself, my son, and um, <clears throat> my, my brother and another friend, we got out here, I put my shoes on and I went knocking on doors. And, and then I just used spoke and uh, I, I text messaged uh, 725 people in like five minutes. I created me a message and was like, boom, 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 boom. I said, oh my God. So when I woke up the next morning and realized that I had won, I said, look at God. They didn't want me in, but I got in anyway. <laughs> I think maybe all your hard work had something to do with it too. Be, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So okay. now I am, I get voted for, um, uh, for vice chair. Um, and so one of the interesting things uh, about that is um, 
I am fifth vice chair. Um, Deborah Diggs is third vice chair, and we are the only um, two vice chairs um, that don't have any roles or responsibilities. So, you know, we'll, we'll still have to do some things there and push some doors open, kick some open, even. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, and I'm going to do my part and do what I can uh, while I'm there as well. Yeah, and uh, some people want to know what you think of the Civilian Review Board. Should we be backing it? So I absolutely think that we should be backing it. Um, but I think that it is going to be just as important to make sure um, going forward, once it is approved, we are going to have to um, absolutely do our part to um, demand what we want is in and on that civilian review board. So it's um, actually uh, responsible to civilians and not to politicians. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um uh, doing away with, um, I know um, one of the things that they were trying to do um, was have um, basically the mayor be in a position to be appointing a, a, a lot of people. And, um, and and I told them that's unacceptable. That That is a non-negotiable um, in, in, this, in, in this particular, um, with this uh, civilian review board, because at that point you have people that are loyal to the mayor and they're not loyal to the citizens. And we have enough of those types of committees already. So yeah, no. <laughs> All right. Well, that's issue two, right? Everybody votes yes on issue two. That's a, lives in the city that, of Columbus, right? I think, that, I think that question said, could it be voted down and then what? So yes, I have um, also thought about um, that. And, 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 and um, full transparency, there, there were some people who were um, having issue with it even being um, put on the ballot because they felt like the mayor's office was kind of basically like copping out city council, you know, and the mayor. Um, but if, if for some reason, I really don't see it being voted down, but if for some reason it is, we, we still are not going to stop. There is still a responsibility that the mayor has for um, uh, owes to our community as well as um, city council. So we're we're still not going to stop if we have to get it and and put it on the ballot again and again. This is the time that we will um, get it done. I understand, you know, in the '80s they tried, in the '90s they tried, but I feel like the um, the climate. Um, the atmosphere is right for us to be able to push it now, um, and you know, and just communi communicating it in all of our um, our circles is going to be um, key um, to this uh, civilian review board getting approved um, at this time. And um, there is also um, um, on Tuesdays. <clears throat> I think it's every Tuesday, but that that board that has been formed um, to create the Civilian Review Board, uh, there's a link that I'll make sure that I send um, to you, Miss Susan, okay. um, to uh, to pass on to everyone because you can actually go and see their meetings and the conversations um, that are going forward um, in in creating the Civilian Review Board. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'll send that along to everybody else after the salon. Okay. And thanks for keeping track of that stuff for us. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, um, a lot of times I, I am like exhausted, but, um, you know, when someone sends me something, I make sure that I do my due diligence um, and, and research and reading and researching it um, and reaching out to people um, if I have to. Um, when I see something that, that doesn't look right or I feel like they trying to, you know, pull a smooth one, I, I go to social media so quick. I, I really am a thorn in their side, um, but I, I, I just don't care. I, I sleep well every night. <laughs> You've got to right. do it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can you get the babies on the screen? I'm sorry? You, you got babies in the background. Put them on. I do. Where's she at? Let me see Kamila. Come here, Damon. All right. These are my grandbabies. There we go. Two of my grandbabies. 
And there, you have three, and we got two there. Yep. All right. Hi. Hi. How are you doing, young man? He, it's three. He said three. He said three. And oh, how old are name? you? Oh. Listen, it said, How old are you? Six. Oh, what? wow. Let me see tonight. Did they go to school? I, they live in um, Cincinnati. So he goes to um, a Montessori school um, in Cincinnati. Oh. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah. How about the dog? He is in the kindergarten. Can I see Kanaya, please? And here is his baby sister, who Bye. will be one on next Saturday. Wow. Whoa. Say hi. 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 Oh, what a cutie. <clears throat> wow. You do not look old enough to have what a cutie. Today either. <laughs> I would never believe it unless I see it, saw it. <laughs> yep. It, and my, uh, my uh, my son, my uh, baby boy, he his daughter will be um, one on Thanksgiving. Wow, well, you got a lot of Christmas presents. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh my God, I have to Santa go. Santa has a lot of Christmas presents. <laughs> right. I said, I got to go Christmas shopping again. I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, nice to meet you. Okay, bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have a safe trip home. <laughs> oh, she blowing kisses. Aww. Oh, yes. Aww. <laughs> Good way oh, to end the award <laughs> ceremony, Adrian Hood. <laughs> the award winner. Once again. <laughs> community Thank activism. You. Adrian, for all your work. For all you do. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So Bob was going to talk a little bit about the Civilian Review Board, and then we'll go into some other issues that are on the ballot this year, uh, this fall. And we got uh, Pat Morita and Kathy Cowan Becker standing by. All right. Uh, I, I don't have much to say uh, other than unless it has, and I've said this publicly, even the dispatch quoted me, unless there's real subpoena power and real resources and staff uh, put into it, uh, nothing's going to change. So uh, it's not just whether it passes, it's how much pressure, how much street heat we put on that body. Because the natural tendency is to be afraid of the police. And not only that, there's reasons to be afraid of the police uh, in the United States. And, and the FOP, uh, again, as a union, has always had virtual veto power uh, over the elected officials here. So it's going to be up to us to pressure uh, this body and make sure they can actually do the job they were selected for. Anybody else have any other comments about the Civilian Review Board? I don't know that it's gotten a whole lot of play like out there in the world for people to know it exists and it's on the ballot. People will see it when they get their absentee ballots or show up, but I'm not sure it's really been promoted Well, the, well. the mayor punted, right? The mayor, did, I mean, originally they were going to put it on the ballot themselves and then they backed away, you know, so it's sort of like, uh, and uh, again, I spent four years with the NAACP negotiating to get this on the ballot and uh, uh, then Mayor uh, Michael Coleman refused to put it on as an ordinance. This is a small step forward, but it also shows a weakness because at one point the mayor was being, acting like a mayor, acting like he had a backbone and taking on the FOP. And then it was, okay, well, we'll leave it up to the people. The mayor knows we need the civilian review board. He just didn't have enough guts uh, uh, to do it himself. And we're not hearing much from the city council people about it, I don't think. Right. You know, they're not out there running a campaign. You're hearing from Adrian. You're hearing from Joe. You're hearing from the people who have been fighting uh, this for, uh, again, decades. There, there, needs, there needs to be a lot of changes, and Adrian knows this too, I'm sure, mm -hmm. that in the FOP contract, in order to give the Civilian Review Board the power they need. Uh -huh. And I was listening to the attorney from Baker Hostetler during the last workshop meeting uh, with the Civilian Review Board, and she, she rattled off about six different articles 
from the contract and that <clears throat> needs to be changed. And some of the, and, and, the, the, and they, she even commented that it's going to be difficult to get them to come to the table and negotiate on some of those articles in that FOP contract. Right. I mean, it, she, she, I hate to say it, but to me, it didn't sound very optimistic uh, about getting them to negotiate on changes and what the city has for leverage to make those changes. So, and that's- well, let's, like, let's, that's let's talk about collective bargaining. That, that's where the fight has to come from is to get that damn contract. Well, we also could disband them, right? We could go full New Jersey on them and dismantle the police and bring them, uh, it would default to the sheriffs and you can reorganize your police department. No, you know, what would you say, Mark? I'm just saying, you, you, be careful about your collective bargaining demands. Remember who the employer is. Just remember. The union is not, I, I, I'm not in support of FOP. Give me this clear. And, 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 but you have to understand, you have to understand collective bargaining is not the answer. Go towards the policy of the city. The city is the issue. Those are the employers. Those are the ones that make the policy. It's not the union. It's not the union. Come on, get off the back of the union. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I'm pro-union, but uh, I mean, let, uh, let me argue, having seen them uh, charge a ton of people, the cops did it, and they're protected by past practices. Because and of it, what the city has allowed. Because of what the city has allowed. Yeah, it's the contract. Period. Is the FOP in Columbus a union or a... Um... No, it's, it's a real union with bargaining power. Okay, okay. I thought maybe it was a benevolent association like New York City. No, no it's okay. still union. No, New York it's City is a union. association is a totally different ballgame. Yeah. No, you, you, New York They're City is a lobby shop. So, so I, I think that it's important to um, remember, especially in the climate in Columbus, um, while Mr. Mark, you're right, um, the, the uh, FOP is the, is the negotiator. Um, for the Columbus Police Department. Um, I think that um, it would be a real disservice for us to um, um, take for granted or, or misunderstand the power that is behind that particular organization with or over our, our elected officials. So um, there, there definitely needs to be um, some things going on, um, in, in my opinion, um, on both sides. Uh, we need to have a strong city council to start with, and those individuals need to be strong at that negotiating table. And so I also, think yeah. to be going on. Yeah. And the Baker Hosteller report proved the police were heavily involved in a cover up. So even when the mayor tries to investigate mm -hmm. them, doesn't really have the backbone to push it, uh, they covered it up. And the stuff they were doing was so appalling at the end. I mean, they were nailing people for inciting riots that weren't doing anything but trying to run away from them. I mean, I got clients. I know the facts. I know what the tapes look like. I mean, this is what they said to the mayor. The mayor said, we're going to investigate the bad cops. And the FOP and the police said, yeah, try it. Oh, lovely. So, so let's get into, I, I'm not going to get into it this right now, but there is how the police react around politics and how the police react around what is in the community. And Ms. Hood, you, you have a good voice on that one, how they're dealing with the community, how they deal with politics. Nobody can see how they deal with the protest, that's a whole other reality. That's a whole other reality. We, that is not in collective bargaining. That is nothing to do with anything. We have to understand that. We have to understand what we're moving into. We're talking about recreating what society is. And that's an important reality that, <laughs> Well, I'm not sure we're we're discussing yet. 
over. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen again because I just wanted to call call attention to something here that um, that people might want to be interested in. Uh, one of the Columbus police officers, female lieutenant, one of the first black female, or maybe only black female lieutenants, um, has written a book about what goes on within the Columbus Police Department in the racism, in the discrimination, and the harassment, and everything that they have been experiencing within the Columbus Police Department. And this is a book you can buy on Amazon, and uh, Melissa was on Bob's radio show a few weeks ago talking about it. She's taking a big big risk writing this book while she's still employed by the Columbus Police Department, but she needs our support too. Um, so it, I'm sure it's a fascinating book that we haven't gotten a copy of yet, but I encourage people to look that up and uh, support Melissa. And, and maybe, I think there's an event next week as well that's supposed yeah. to be supportive of Melissa. I can send that out to people when I find it. So let's move on to issue okay. one. We have Kathy Cowan Baker, who's going to tell us a little bit about issue one. Kathy, are you still here? Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, great, so um, I've been working and helping the campaign on issue one. I'm also running a very similar campaign in Grove City for a very, well, a very similar issue called issue 10. Um, so both of them, so, just a, by way of introduction, um, so I'm chair of Ready for 100 in Ohio, which is a campaign of the Sierra Club to ask cities to commit to 100% renewable energy. So, so far we have 168 cities, 13 counties, eight states, DC and Puerto Rico that have all made some form of this commitment. And that covers 100 million people or one in three in the United States. So that's just a way of saying a lot of cities are doing similar things. And so what issue one and issue 10 both would do is set up a, choice, a program called community choice aggregation. And this is something we've been talking to the city about for the last several years. So community choice aggregation is actually only legal in nine states, but uh, we're actually lucky Ohio is one. It's the one place where we have a decent energy law. Um, it was established in Ohio in 1999 and so far around 400 cities, counties, and townships have taken advantage of this program. So what it would allow us to do is pool together most of our residents and businesses, not, not all are eligible, but um, about probably about two thirds are, and we could use them to bargain for our electricity basically and to obtain bulk purchase rates. So uh, you could say it's sort of like a Costco for electricity. Damn it. Um, so right now we each pay our electric bills individually and as one person or one small business, you don't have a lot of bargaining power, but with this purchasing power, you can obtain lower rates. And so issue one would allow the city to negotiate with the utility and um, Grove City has not chosen a utility yet, but Columbus has. Um, they went through an RFP process and chose AEP Energy. Um, and so that would allow the city to work with them to get competitive, good rates, on behalf of residents and businesses. Um, and last year, Worthington passed a similar measure, a similar aggregation initiative for 100% renewable energy. And in the first 10 months of that program, residents and businesses in Worthington saved about $100,000 collectively. So, but Columbus is, and Grove City both are, would be taking this a step further. So besides um, just pooling together demand, they can use it to also leverage out a certain type of supply. So specifically, the city would contract to build out, um, they would ask AEPs and they, they put this in the RFP for the utilities and said, okay, we want to switch to 100% renewable energy and we want it done through local build out, through building out new, or at least build out in Ohio of new renewable energy projects to meet this demand. And our collective demand in Columbus is like 1.7 million kilowatt hours um, in Grove City, it's somewhat less, but it would be building out local supply to meet that demand. Um, and so this would have a number of beneficial effects. So first, it would create jobs in construction, um, in maintenance, in manufacturing, because those solar panels have to come from somewhere. Um, and we'd like to get as many of these jobs as possible in the local area, and especially the opportunity neighborhoods in Columbus. Um, secondly, it would lower our carbon pollution. So this is where the environmental groups are very interested in this because 
most policies to lower carbon emissions are very incremental, like a little bit of energy efficiency on office buildings. Um, so this would lower the emissions coming out of Columbus by 1.2 million megatons um, per year, which is a huge impact for one program. So depending on how you're counting the total emissions of Columbus, that's somewhere between 11 and 19%, but it's still a big impact for one program. And then finally, the contract with AEP that Columbus made um, includes money for community grants and specifically um, the RFP named eight neighborhoods and those are Franklinton, Hilltop, Linden, Near East, Northeast, Northland, Southeast, and the South Side. And so we don't know yet what these community grants are going to look like. And so um, I guess froze. Want to see from these community grants and this is where the city needs to hear from you. And so if so right now actually the city is holding aggregation advisory board meetings that are public that you can attend and put things in the chat if you want to. I did that last week. Um, and if this passes then they'll be required to hold two public meetings and you can give the city your input there as well. Um, Ready for 100 has provided some input about what we want to see out of those grants. We'd like to see solar panels on schools and community centers, um, incentives for residents to install solar panels. I know the, um, the neighborhood meetings, people have been telling the city they're very interested in distributed solar and incentives for solar. We'd also like to see programs to get landlords to make energy upgrades so that tenants pay less in utility bills. A lot of low-income people rent. and. So there's that split incentive that we want to see the city address. Um, so that's kind of issue one in a nutshell. The Sierra Club endorsed it unanimously. And um, that's issue 10 as well, although as I said, Grove City is waiting until after to see if it passes first, which I'm working very hard to try to get it passed in Grove City um, and to, before taking next steps. And so I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, so, Kathy, are you getting a good response from most people you talk to about it? Is this likely to pass? Um, yeah, the people we've texted in Grove City, we've gotten a pretty good response from. Of course, not most people don't answer a text, so it's really hard to tell, but I got several responses that they'd already voted for it. How about um, issue one altogether for the city? So right now it's polling, like, it's. it seems like I'm hearing that it's polling pretty well, but it's a little closer than they want, so. I can't you know, imagine why anybody would be against it. Uh, yeah, I know. And I, I think a lot of it is just the language by itself on the ballot is pretty confusing. Electric aggregation, like what the hell is that? <laughs> so sometimes people vote no on something if they don't know what it is. And so unless they hear, this is what it is, this is what it would do, this is how it would benefit us, like they, they might vote no. So that's really the point of the campaign um, that we're running in Grove City is just to tell people this is what it is and what it would do. So it's really uh, important that, oh, did somebody have something to say? Rob, Rome, and I got a question. I do. I have a question. I got a question too when you get a chance. Okay, go ahead, okay, Arata. Suzanne, I guess I'll let you moderate those questions yeah. and I'll try to answer them. Uh, Bob Rome first. Oh, okay, <laughs> Bob Rome first. So Bob Rome. Um, Bob Rome, sorry. <laughs> I used to work at the former Long's bookstore where half of our electricity came from city power and half of it came from what's now AEP. That's number one. Number two, I live in Upper Arlington where I got this invitation to switch from AEP to another supplier. Would this ballot initiative impact all three electrical providers or more or just AEP? Benefit is not the word I meant to say. Right, yeah, so it's just AEP. So if you're on city utility, it would not affect that. And um, that's another thing that we want to get them to 100% renewable, but it would not affect that. It would not affect people who are on PIP, like if you're at the poverty level paying a percentage of income payment, you wouldn't be covered. Or if you've gone on apples to apples and you've already made a contract with somebody else for you know, two years or whatever, like when you come off that, you could join, but you wouldn't be taken off a contract you're on. Or if you're like a really large business, like a Walmart, and you have your own energy supplies already, you're not affected. So it's about two thirds of city businesses and residents that would be covered. And then if this passes and it's put into effect, everyone who's eligible will get letters saying, 
you're going to be switched into this program unless you want to opt out. So anyone could opt out at any time and that letter would prompt it, but at any time anyone could opt out with no penalties or fees. Thanks. Well, you see that there from, uh, Rob, you want to follow up? Um, Will you see any of that information on your bill? Um, I, I think you, I think there is a line that you see, but I'm honestly not exactly sure what you'd see on your bill. We supposedly have it out in our township since 2017 or something. And I look at my bill and I don't, Which I have to you know, revisit it, but in Lincoln County, Harrison Township. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. Go ahead, Araya. I was wondering if there's a way that um, that language or, you know, some of these programs, uh, Kathy, uh, could also include um, communities like mine. It, it used to um, uh, qualify for the, uh, the Third Frontier program that came out with uh, Obama's uh, program in like, I don't know, 2008 or so. Um, I had applied for a, a grant for this community here because these were built in the 80s. And that program was to bring old communities like this. Um, and there's 318 units here. So it's like a small city, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that are all antiquated. And, and uh, I had actually been approved by the um, program to do a six million dollar project here for this community but the board here declined it so it didn't happen and now 10 years later we're we're you know looking at spending millions of dollars to fix you know a 40 year old community you know it's just it's going to be insane and we could have had the siting upgrade we could have literally brought this thing up to a lead pl certified platinum, you know, uh, standard. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can get another chance to do that. I'll pitch it again. If, if this uh, thing passes, would, would, would it include old communities to get them to not be so inefficient? So energy efficiency is like, that's kind of the foundation of getting, you know, energy efficiency and renewable energy kind of go hand in hand. But this would be about the electricity being put onto the grid. And so there may be energy efficiency upgrade possibilities through those community grant programs. If, you know, if that's something that they, like, they'll get a lot of suggestions of what to do. And there may be other, I guess, programs that can help with energy efficiency upgrades. But if you are in the city of Columbus, then you would be covered in terms of just the electricity coming through the wires in, but that's what aggregation refers to. So it, it's not specifically about energy efficiency, but that could be part of the grants or there may be other grant programs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm sorry your community turned it down back then under the Obama administration because they should have taken advantage of it. I agree. Mm -hmm. So, okay, because we have a lot of roof space and parking lot space that we could put a lot of solar on too. You know, that was part of the pitch. So if there's, you know, a way we could feed the grid, you know, it was a, it had a multi-prong approach to the whole project and part of it included feeding the grid. Mm -hmm. So, but definitely at least upgrading everything so that we weren't hemorrhaging energy, which is what we're doing. We have ancient windows, ancient everything. And so now, you know, I'm just, we can talk. I don't want to take up any more time here, but thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Who had another question? Um, I did. Um, Kathy, I live in Grove City too. Um, do you have um, any flyers or yard signs that could be put out? Because I don't think anybody, I, I haven't heard, this is the first time I've heard about this. Yeah, so um, we just texted like 13,000 people we had cell phones for in Grove City, but most people haven't heard of Issue 10. And we have a website, yesforissue10.com. You can get the whole scoop there. And then for Columbus, actually for people in Columbus, if you go to cleanenergycolumbus.org, that's probably the best website for, and I'll put these links in the chat when I'm done, but that's the best website for explaining issue one. But yes, we have yard signs coming in next week and I would be happy yeah, to get you one for issue 10. Um, there's somebody else that has yard signs for issue one and um, probably the website's your best place to go get information. And we did also send out a flyer and we have 
or, or like a lit mailing into Grove City and we have another one coming out um, probably shortly after, like we're gonna get that out next week. We have a question from Connie Hammond and Tim Chavez. Connie's asking how would it affect homes that have solar panels but are also on the grid with AEP and I think I can ask Tim's question for you, but maybe you can elaborate. Uh, the opinion, they are actually working with AEP on this and AEP is saying this aggregation will definitely be used to uh, accommodate solar and wind power only, right? Am I right in that, Kathy? Yeah, so everything, and I've been talking a lot to AEP and everything we're hearing from them is this is solar and wind, it's not nuclear, it's not gas, it's not fracking. Um, all the project lists I've seen from them are solar and wind. Um, sure. And then as far as if you have solar panels, I mean, it pretty much worked the same way it does now, except that the energy you're getting through the, you know, if you're using energy from the grid, that, that coming in would also be from renewables, just from and, like a utility scale project in Madison County or something. So Connie's question was uh, the opinion, oh, not opinion. Uh, if you have solar panels and you're with AEP, would you still get that discount, right? I would think you would. I think so. I don't think it would affect that. Okay. Well, thank you, Kathy, very much. We're going to move on with Pat Morita to give us a very quick update. I know that repealing HB6 isn't on the ballot, but it is still something that people need to know about. And there's a yard sign campaign. We had some on our porch for a while, and we might be getting some more. Um, so, Pat, can you tell us just uh, what is it that anybody can do to try to help HB6 being repealed? Okay, well, oh, thanks for inviting me, and I just want to give a shout out to Kathy for the work that she's done in getting this, you know, helping to get this on the ballot and managing to get this recalcitrant city to, uh, you know, the mayor and the city council to support this is just was just uh, remarkable to me. Of course, she had a good team working with her as well, but I mean, she, you know, she's the power powerhouse behind it all. And, and then I wanted to thank you and Bob for, for those um, pictures of the, uh, 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 of the free press covers, because I thought of so many of them and it reminded, you know, one that especially reminded us of our own power because it said, what if the progressive movement didn't exist? And it had a picture of the, the trice burning power plant, you know, running and spewing out all kinds of stuff. And it had that a 300 foot statue of Christopher Columbus, you know, looming over the city. And it had like Pickerington Ponds housing development and, and other things. And so that was one of my favorites. But um, so, so House Bill 6, yeah, you probably all know that that passed last a uh, year ago in July and it gave well, close probably to $1.3 billion, just a gift to First Energy to spend any way they wanted to, uh, supposedly though, to, you know, to bail out Davis, Bessie and Perry, their two nuclear power plants on Lake Erie, plus a couple of coal plants on the Ohio River, one of which was in Indiana. Of course, that money just went to First Energy or would, because scheduled to go to First Energy, even though they also have two nuclear plants at Beaver Valley, Pennsylvania, which is four miles from the Ohio border. So it was just kind of weird that almost exactly a year after it passed, um, that's when Householder, the Speaker of the House, and four other people uh, were arrested on on uh, bribery and racketeering charges by the FBI and the courts. And, um, and um, first, be because uh, they had given around 60, had been given around $60 million, most of it, or the bulk of it, coming from First Energy uh, through, uh, through a, a 501c4 illegally. Uh, the name of that group was was Generation Now. <clears throat> so um, 
So that was, you know, that's quite the scandal. And there were 20 other people besides household or 20 other legislators that got money from this illegal slush fund, although they have plausible deniability. So it's, it's doubtful that any of them would be arrested. Uh, but this thing passed by one vote, uh, it, narrowly House Bill 6, and all the shenanigans, and I think everybody knows about that. But so what, where do we go from here? Well, in a really dirty trick, uh, the uh, CUPS uh, uh, created a, a Senate Energy Committee, uh, a Senate Select Committee on Energy Policy and Oversight. Uh, to take up the issue of House Bill 6 instead of the Senate Energy and Public Utilities Committee, which is still meeting on a regular basis. So this, the Senate Select Committee on Energy Policy and Oversight had, I think, just two meetings. And uh, they didn't come to any conclusion. And now CUP has said, well, we're not going right? to have <laughs> Yeah, if you can remember the name of this committee, you're doing very well. Uh, uh, so they, so they're not meeting again till goodness knows when, but certainly not after the election, and probably, you know, who knows whether they'll be meeting in lame duck. But anyway, what people can do, uh, well, first of all, I have an article that's on the Free Press website, and if you go there, there's some. There's a little bit more information about, you know, some of the background of this and about exactly where to go and what to do. But I will give you this phone number. And if you have a pen and pencil to write it down, because this number makes it really easy to call your state senator. You dial the number and then it asks you for your zip code and then it puts you right directly to your state senator. So you don't have to know who your state senator is even. You just call 855-980-2397. And I'll say that again, 855-980-2397. And, or you can text, the other thing you can do is you can text HB6. Uh, to 69866. So that's text HB6 to 69866, and that will also take you to your state senator. And another thing you can do there is a hashtag. It's pound repeal HB6. And you can use that in your tweets or in um, uh, wherever you, or, or, or on, your, on your phone, whenever you're whatever you're doing, uh, pound, repeal, HB6. So uh, those are, that's what you can do to contact your senators because they're the ones that really are important. And you can also contact other senators. It doesn't have to be your senator. You can, uh, there's a spreadsheet online under my article and it tells um, just how you can, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, all the, it gives you directly all the emails and you can just go there and, 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 and text this message to various senators. So it's fairly easy. Thank you. And, 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 and one other thing I want to say is that the message that we want to put out, you know, as bad as Davis, Bessie and Perry are, uh, they, they'd like to have a discussion of the merits of nuclear power. And the real issue is we don't want to give this, this criminal, well, this dishonest, company, why would we give them one point, you know, $1.3 billion? So that's the main message is do not give our ratepayer money in the time of COVID when people are, you know, people are struggling with their, to pay their food and rent and they would have to increase their electricity to, to give this money to First Energy, a criminal company. So the, the largest bribery and money, money laundering scheme ever perpetrated against the people of the state of Ohio. So, so yeah. Can you give so, us that number one more time? The phone number one more phone time? Phone number 855-980-2397. So thanks everybody. In, thanks it's everybody. It's in the chat too. And I don't know if people have questions, but I'll try to answer if they do. Any questions? 
if not, Bob has a few words to say about how we are all going to go about voting. Pete Johnson had to pop off the call, but Pete Johnson is the president. Thank you very much, Pat, by the way. We appreciate that update because I wasn't Thanks. sure what to do myself about any of that, but I knew a lot of signs were coming out from people's yards and people need to know what, you know, what it is they're exactly supposed to do to help stop this thing. Um, but on to quickly uh, the elections. Early voting started on Tuesday. Um, there, there didn't seem to be any problems at the polls uh, so far. Pete Johnson, our president of the board, he's kind of organizing election uh, protection people. And he himself has been kind of circling the block and looking inside and out to try to see if there's any intimidation going on or any problems. And so far, nothing's been reported above and beyond the fact that um, outside of that, people are getting the wrong absentee ballots. And I just couldn't believe that happened. It just was beyond my, my comprehension. But we ordered one for my 90-year-old dad. It, it arrived at his house in Clintonville. I looked it up, and it was a, a ballot for the 3rd District, and he lives in the 12th District. So it even happened to my father. He so got the, the wrong ballot. The key point, uh, if you read the dispatch, uh, an error occurred at 224 Saturday. Uh, an unknown person changed the setting on the machine. Now, the, unknown. the interesting part of it all, you wonder why there wasn't cameras there that would have captured or narrowed the suspect, Absolutely. is you've got, uh, Ohio has, as all of you know, the most... Uh, gerrymandered uh, congressional districts in the United States. And one of those things is the dense pack, the third district with black voters. So if you're giving them a ballot in Clintonville, which is the 12th district and a democratic enclave, well, who it's really ha uh, happening, uh, helping is Representative Balderson, right? So the possibility that he might leave. Uh, so, and uh, oddly, uh, there's been 100,000 blank ballots set out in Brooklyn, which is overwhelmingly Democratic. And the initial, many initial ballots in LA area, the presidential election was left off uh, the ballot. So uh, in the, those first three incidents, every single one of them helps Trump. So uh, while Trump is talking about false elections, if you look at the pattern, and all of this is recorded uh, in the mistakes happen, but can you trust the mail? So uh, uh, there's a variety of questions that arise, but Balderson uh, is being helped and how in the hell? Uh, and of course, Ed Leonard said we're treating it as Ed inadvertent. Leonard, that, Ed Leonard, who's the director of the Franklin County Board of Election, says we're treating it like an error. And the quick, correct approach is to treat it like neither an error uh, or deliberate, but to actually investigate and base it on the actual facts. And why in the hell don't you have cameras on a machine that can fix elections? And that's what this uh, machine can do. If you're sending out uh, you know, the wrong ballot, you're sending the third, uh, the dense pack black district candidate uh, to Clintonville, you know, that's just absurd. You're actually messing uh, with who could possibly control uh, the U.S. House of Representatives. Now, we didn't discover this with my dad till Friday night, and we couldn't call the Board of Elections, which will, is what we're going to do Monday morning, because on the website it says, call Aaron Sellers at the Board of Elections to, and tell him whether you want a new ballot or you're going to change your mind and go vote early. But who's going to really know to do that? And how many people are going to look up to see if they have the right ballot? And how many people actually know who their representatives are to know that they have the wrong ballot? Well, so plus your, uh, her father's 90 years old, and a lot of the demographics uh, are known. Virtually every uh, voting, get out the vote in both party, knows tremendous amounts of uh, micro data uh, about the individuals uh, that are voting from voting patterns uh, to where these would go. So another thing to make sure all your friends and family know about is check the ballot, make sure you look up your address and make sure that you are in, that you've gotten a ballot for the right congressional and yeah. state representative districts. And if you get the wrong one, call the Board of Elections, which is 614-525-3100, as far as I can remember. There's, and, a small, there's a small number, Suzanne, there's a small right. number down at the bottom that 
everybody uh, needs to make sure that it correlates to what they're supposed to have. Now, and that, that sucks. That sucks. Oh, so, yeah. Bob, be ready to go to the Supreme Court. And then the people who, who decide to go early vote say they got the wrong ballot and they're just like, oh, screw it, I'm going to go early vote. Well, they show up there and then their vote won't be counted because they right. got an absentee ballot. So you don't know about that either. So it's already become a kludge with the Franklin County elections. Now, I don't know how it is on, in other counties and all over the state, or was it just Franklin County that had this problem? I know it's all over the country, but if people can feel safe enough and secure enough with your social distancing and your mask, and if you haven't sent away for an absentee ballot, we recommend you go to the early voting site. They're being very safe about it. And you go in there with your gloves or however much Perel you want and, and vote on paper. They will offer you a paper ballot. And no, then, they, they likely not to offer, but well, you, you could ask, ask for, for it. <laughs> yeah. You don't want the one where the machine marks it for you. You want the one you mark it yourself, and then they put it into the and you can take digital tabulator. You can bring in a sample ballot with you. You can take a photo of it at, when you're done to make sure that you have proof of what you voted and, and, and everything. But, you know, if you can vote in person, do it. If you got the right absentee ballot, we also recommend that you don't mail wow. it back. You drive to the Board of Elections and drop it in the little slot, or you ask somebody you know that has a car and is out and about the, to take your ballot there yeah, and the, drop it in the a drop slot. The drop box is visible and it's right out front. And that way you're not depending on the mail to mail your ballot back in. Did you have something to add, Bob Reed? Yeah. First, because of what you just said, the person carrying your ballot has to be a close relative. It can't be anybody. Oh. It's limited to that. How would they got, know? When I got my ballot in the mail, I heard about the being false addresses. And so I went to look up my address on the Board of Elections website. It didn't work. But when I searched by my name, I did find it. Now that was just maybe one instance, but- Pat, Pat Morita had the same problem. You had a problem too, didn't you, Pat? Yeah, I couldn't get on. I searched by my name and address and they couldn't find me, but I had signed up to get a, uh, an absentee ballot you know, uh, online. And so when I went to that different, just slightly different link, they had, they had me there. And then it showed my voting record and I was stunned to see that two of my last two mail-in ballots for the two last two primaries were, not that, were invalid because it said wrong date. So the date was wrong. So I don't know whether I forgot to fill in the date, but why should there be a date? Why should there be one more opportunity for people to, um, you know, to make a mistake? It's not like, it's not like, it's not like this, is a, this isn't a will. You, know? you, you have to put your birthday, and if you mistakenly put today's date, that invalidates it. Right. No, but if you look at your ballot, the very last thing under your signature is the date, which is, you can understand if it's a will or if you're buying a property, but why do you need to have a date for your ballot when, you know, when it's the, the election? Because they want you to have, because they need the date. So if you put in like November 4th, 2020, too late. It needs to be in. You have to have the date that you filled out the ballot and send it out or or whatnot. That's what they're looking for exactly. Right. But, but they can also get you on the uh, postage stamp date as well. It has to be postmarked yeah, one day before. The one day election. before, and then you have 10 days for it to get there in the mail. And that's why you should drop it. I'm sorry. No, no one from Free Press should be voting in November. They should be voting in October if they're going early. If not, go to your damn polling place and be proud and go there and do your thing. Well, some people don't want to be out in public, though, Mark. You know, people that are... I'm public. there. I'm going with my brother. I'm going yes. with my brother. Yes. I got yes. him registered. He hasn't been in the country for 10 years. I'm bringing that motherfucker to where I'm voting. Fairmore, Fairmore yes, Elementary. Sorry. Come Fairmore Elementary, 2.30 p.m. on November 3rd. We're going to be there. 
All right. Well, it's a good, good, good time. Then. It should be low turnout time at 2.30. I'm going hey, one. Are they open on Monday? let it be low turnout then. Hey, it's hey, first, right? You, you don't want to be there at morning lunch or <laughs> after work. Right. Who else? Oh, I got, I got precinct has... one. Re Barrick Recreation Center is one, two, three. Uh, it's like number, like the number one uh, numbers of Board of Elections. I'll be there. I'm opening up at five, five in the morning there. So good for uh, you. Lynn, I think Lynn Stan has a comment. I do. I'm actually working at Board of Elections. And I'm um, help so, but it really has been very confusing in terms of the whole thing with this whole thing. I'm sitting actually in the space where they're doing the press conferences, which is, I'm just doing my little computer work, but that's all going on. But if it is, because when you sign up for absentee ballot, you have decided to go on the paper ballot path. So when you come, definitely bring that paperwork. But what's going to happen is those people who got that wrong ballot, they're going to get a second ballot. So the point is when you come to, people were misled and thought that when you go to Morse Road, you're going to then go onto a machine. No, you're still going to complete a paper ballot, but it is going to be scanned that day right. and uh -huh. received. Okay, so that is another reason why they're encouraging people. And if you have gotten, like I feel like I've gotten, and I'm a poll worker, I feel like I've gotten additional paperwork. and just bring all that different tell people to bring it all in or pack it all together in their packet that they drop off so there's never a confusion of you know did they vote more than once yada 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 so um and it's been going very well the weather as long as i i just hope it's a month of good weather because people have been there and it seems like it's under an hour of processing going through and people have been very um complimentary um, but yes it has been very confusing of um, what's going to happen when you you get there if you had we trying to take your paper ballot and then do it on you're not going to be on a machine. So Lynn, you've been at 1700. Lynn, you've been at 1700. Morse Road, 1700 Morse Road. Yep. Yeah. Lynn, maybe we can write up what you just described and pr print it on the you know put it on the free press. You know, sure. this, I don't know if you know Mary B. Reloto, but she did a good little write up on her Facebook. Okay, okay maybe That's you could send great. that. To, if you can find it, send it to me. Right, and they are looking for poll workers that are registered as um, Republicans or on, because they certainly have a lot of Democrats, but they still need positions. To right. Now, yeah. in, in in their team, they were trying to drag them out of line uh, up in the 55th. They were like shouting whether any Republicans wanted to work because it was they couldn't <laughs> find it. <laughs> At least in my neighborhood. Is there any more comments or questions Seems about Lynn. the election? Well, Lynn, Lynn, I'd like to ask you something. Are you open on Monday seeing it's some um, Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day? It is open. It is, Good. It, Thank you. It's we, not don't, knowledge. we don't represent that no more. <laughs> okay, yeah, Winnie, you had a question and then we have one uh, in the in the chat. So okay. So I'm going to vote very close to the election because God only knows if the candidates are even going to be alive because of COVID on election day. So I want to wait and see, but I'm going to vote before election day because God only knows what's going to go down on election day. And if you have a absentee ballot, you can't go and vote on election day that you can just cast a provisional ballot. But if you go early to the election site, you can, as I said, They'll, they'll give you a paper ballot and it will be scanned right then. It won't be a provisional ballot. So, but my friend Ron Hess went to the um, early voting on Morse Road and he swears that he clicked on Joe Biden and saw the green arrow, but then at the end it said, you did not choose a presidential candidate. And if he had just clicked and said, yes, he approved his choices and not noticed that that green arrow for Joe Biden wasn't there, he, he wouldn't have voted. So that's another, um, concern. Yeah, no, the, the, the machines are supposed to, I mean, there's, Ohio's notorious for uh, uh, undervotes. Uh, uh, Dayton, uh, back uh, a few years, had 30,000 people didn't vote for U.S. Senate, and sure, Brown ended up in a very tight race. So, uh, yeah, people need to look for that. The machines are actually designed uh, to prompt you and they've had a lot of problems, at least complaints in the urban centers uh, about, uh, you know, that. 
So Sandy, you had a question? Do we have Sandy? <clears throat> Sandy made a comment earlier. What to do if our county state does end up stealing the election? What's going to happen? Well, I, I would recommend a, a debate. Harvey and I have uh, written a, uh, a article on a call for the uh, general strike and the history of general strikes. Yeah, burn the bitch down. <laughs> I think Mark Stansberry's got had a few drinks in him tonight. <laughs> Are there any more questions or comments on the elections? Because Mark. Mark, you have an announcement to give us before we run out of time here, right? Are there any extra polls? Oh, one more question? Extra polls. Oh, uh, there polls? Will there be exit polls? Yes. Uh, the consortium, uh, the major news networks and the AP will, in fact, uh, have exit polls. Uh, and the exit not in the United States, but everywhere else in the world, the U.S. government, U.S. State Department says the exit polls are red flags for voter fraud. We just don't recognize them in the United States. Now back to Sandy Bolzina's question, there are several groups, uh, I would say ours is one, and John Brakey, who's online, is another, that are poised to sue or to bring, bring out into the open things that might be fact, you know, lawsuits after the fact, though I'm of the mindset we don't want to wait till after the fact. We want to make sure we prevent any of this stealing going on during the election and not try to, yeah. um, you know, try to have a lawsuit later. Can Someone, you guys hear me? Who's this? This is Harvey. Harvey. Oh, yes. Hi, Harvey. Hi, Harvey. Hi. Oh, okay. so I have a first for the Columbus Free Press Zoom. This is the first participant from the beach on Malibu. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, oh, cool. we can't Oh, look at cool. that. It's still daytime there. Yeah, it's still yeah, daytime. It's so I wanted to ask Pat and at? others on, on HB6, can you circulate a list of all those uh, state senators and representatives who voted for HB6 so they can be defeated in this election? Yes. Question for Pat? Yeah, yeah, I was on mute. Yeah, I can do that. I think it would be very helpful because we're not going to get anywhere with these jerks uh, asking them to, to repeal it. But if we can vote out all the people that voted for it, including some Democrats, uh, maybe we can beat it in the next session. I have a good list that Neil Wagoner has made of state senators who both voted for HB6 and then have not agreed to uh, not sign anything that they should appeal it. And it's quite a long list. And those are the main... Those are our main targets. And really yeah, that, list, that list is online. That list is actually online with my last article in the Free Press. Oh, okay. the well, Bob, maybe you and I should do a piece on, uh, for Ohio voters to make sure to vote out anybody that voted for that thing. Right. Your boy Cup. You, you, Your boy Cup. You, know, you have to vote for a Republican because some Democrats voted for it. Well, Harvey, it's great to hear from you, Harvey. Well, thank you. It's, it's a, a first. I didn't think I'd get this on my phone, but here's another look at the ocean. It, I think we can't really see it that well. But, yeah, right oh, there, there it is. There it is. Nice. Looks great. Woo. And now all of a sudden we see like redness. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not at a nude beach, so that, that's not worth it. But <laughs> that's, probably why, that's probably why it's not being flown out there. Now. Looks like you're here. Okay. Bill has questions. Thank you. Just a quick comment, I, and I'm not sure if it was mentioned or not, but Leonard said they were going to send out 50,000 more ballots to those who got the wrong ones, and that if people do not send in the new correct ballot, they will count the votes from the original one that they sent in, except for... The, if they voted for like the uh, state representative or, or Congress person on that ballot, it won't be counted. Oh, that's interesting. And, yeah. they're, they're <laughs> going, and they're also going to, uh, they're going to hold those bad ballots like after the election for 10 days or something like that. But uh, so that's the way they're, they're going to try and remedy the, the bad ballot send out well, issue. Well, can you now vote twice? You can vote your uh, yeah. bad ballot and your good ballot. Right. Oh, yeah, well, that's, 
<laughs> and then you can go to jail for voting twice. <laughs> no, they'll count the they'll count the right one and throw out the the bad one. You're not throwing out anything till. Pat, you only get to vote twice if you're rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're Those supposed to happen. hold all the ballots, good and bad, for 22 months. Crusoe's right. Oh, well, well but do they? We'll see. You know, what's their history? Hey, well, we know their history. 56 of the 88 counties complied with the law in 04. Yeah. Thanks. A lot of them forgot. Okay, Mark, give your, Mark, please give your uh, announcement before it gets too late. Can I, can I share real quick? Yes. Boom. That's my announcement. <laughs> no, October 12th is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And? Indigenous Peoples Day. And Columbus no longer celebrates Columbus Day, so right. they have so, not so our victory, so our victory since 1991. I want you to understand our victory. We have kicked the boat out of the ocean. Woo! Yeah, we have kicked the uh, so-called metal statue that had been in since 1955 out of the ocean. Yes, and the, we kicked the, uh, the, statue. the artificial, the artificial statue at Columbus State off the ocean. Yay. And the last one we have, the last one we have is on the State House. There's and so, so on May 31st, when they blew up, the state house, perhaps there was a little uh, justice done. I don't know, but I I just want to share this as being what I am right here, and that's all. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time. We had a we had a movement several years ago along with the Native American Center to call Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day, and City yeah. Council did not choose to do that but yeah. they called it indigenous people's week <laughs> but that yeah. didn't carry on i don't think they still do that but at yeah, least that was got... october 10th to the 16th and we also got the general assembly to do the same thing mm -hmm. so if if you keep talking about our our victories yes yeah. but and, uh, uh but black lives matter that cultural re revolution that we're in the midst of they have always recognized, recognized indigenous peoples. And right. so um, our, 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 our movement continues and we need to ex experience love, loss, and victory. Uh, and of course, some of the tactics used as Mark well knows, uh, Native Americans went down to the ship uh, with change, change. Uh, chains and offered uh, to chain themselves up to make it more historically uh, accurate yeah. as the start of the slave trade. Yeah. yeah. So and then, I mean, you got wounded knee. You got you got what's going on right now with uh, the, the 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 pipes. You know, the pipeline. The the, the water is sacred. All that. The motion is still there, and we've had we've lost so many of our leaders. I mean, if you start thinking about Mark and Mark Ken, Kenny Irwin, Kenny Irwin, Irwin. Mm -hmm. uh, our local, our local, our local leaders, they have died. They've passed on. Um, Dennis Banks, Dennis all Banks. of them. I mean, there's many, many that have passed on. Uh, but remember that there's a lot of young people picking up. A lot of a lot of young people picking up. So. Well, on that note, we will end this second Saturday salon. I thank everybody right. for joining us. Thank you for Happy all your participation. Uh, and thank you for our, your birthday wishes. And like I said, Bob and I are trying to put together a 50th anniversary book with a lot of art and and words in it about what what we've been doing for the past 50 years. 
and we'll let you know when that's ready. It'll probably be a little while. Right, yeah, for your coffee table, the mm -hmm. best graphics. So you'll see some of the work we looked at tonight. And so Lynn Stan, who is uh, in involved in that, uh, thanks again. Yes, and uh, Colin Nyberger as well. He's still with us. All right, so uh, I don't know, Mark, if you want, do you want to stop sharing, Mark? I'm trying. <laughs> And Colin says, thank everybody for letting me be part of this. Oh, we, we really appreciate you being involved, Colin. It's nice to hear from you. Just, just one last thing to everybody. It's, it's wonderful that this free press is still there, yeah, that it's awesome. been here for 50 years, and may it last 50 more years. We need it more now than ever. Yeah, that's right. Agreed. Hallelujah. I got a Can I make a co quick comment? Yes. On Melissa McFadden's event is on October 22nd, which is a Thursday from 4 to 6 p.m. at police headquarters. And I also have to show this real quick. I have a 92 free press edition that there's something in there. It's laying around the house with my stuff, but I got to show what, you. What's the headline? You had it upside down. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's backwards. So oh, well. your image. It's well, hey, image. this is the most important part right here. Bob and his Christmas sweater. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Before I started smoking oh, that for a while. <laughs> oh, he's cute. That's Look from 92. So that's 28 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably before Bob met Suzanne. Uh, hey, no, no. Yeah, oh, yeah. What, yeah, it was. I mean, Suzanne no, I met, no, in I high met school him in, back then. Or, no, I met him in 1989 when I was like uh, 30 years old. <laughs> and we, sure did, and we met at a protest and we <laughs> chanted George Bush CIA. How many nuns have you raped today? George, George Bush what? CIA. How many priests have you killed today? Wow. Uh -oh. That was, uh -oh. not El Salvador. It was after the police, uh, the priest being slaughtered in, in El, El Salvador. Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah. How unromantic. Hey, I have <laughs> our first <laughs> meeting on tape. What did you say? You should show that sometime. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> I get the VHS like tape to work. <laughs> yeah, you can't. It, those don't work anymore. <laughs> they might. We got old equipment out there about out back, you know. Oh my god. In that office. You, you haven't know. sold any of it yet. What about that? everything's still back there? Charlotte Owens, did you so, want to say something? Charlotte, did you have something to say? On, uh... Oh, you're muted. You're muted. I know. No, I didn't have anything to say. I was just uh I, I thought I thought I was muted, and I thought maybe you heard me cackle and laughing at somebody. I love the way, I love your chant that you, the way you remember, I mean, some people have different things, and then you've got this chant that you're doing together. This is well, really. Tell us, about, tell us about your election. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, Charlotte, okay. another one of our central oh, committee members. Candidate. Um, so, yes, I am running for House District 78, which is, uh, it's very gerrymandered. It's uh, run from Circleville to South Zanesville, uh, part, all are part of six counties, wrapping around Perry County. So, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, I, you know, in this era, we're not knocking on doors. So it's more uh, mailing, calling, uh, yard signs. Uh, social media, that sort of thing. Wow, Charlotte, good for you. That is wonderful. Is Margaret Stewart? Oh, John Brakey, anything to report on elections? Any quick updates? Not really. I mean, if you, if everybody's keeping up what's going on in Georgia, the last minute software change, Bob, you remember yeah. what happened back in uh, with uh, Mickey Dunhall and all that? I do. Well, George is in that kind of a game right now. Two Senate seats, seats up. And uh, we're in five states. Uh, we're worried, but uh, and, and not knowing where this thing really could go, because you look at the polls and what's going on. Uh, I don't know. I think all of us are wondering and just like, wow, this is going to be something else. So let's hope for a big turnout and, and maybe do the election prayer. 
You know, that's what we all pray that there is a big whopping coming and that the people really have spoken and that we're on the road to change and hopefully transparent elections. I don't know. I'm hopeful, but worried. And I think I USA. I've been doing great work. Hey, John, how did you get the Stonehenge background? I want to know. <laughs> I have a green screen room and, uh, oh, in my yeah. house. And oh, so nice. I converted it. And so I can put up or do presentations. <laughs> and have people hey, I just want to say, um, the, the New York oh, Times is reporting today that there's huge uh, uh, absentee uh, early voting vote by mail turnouts in Democratic strongholds all over the country. You might want to look at the times today. It's very encouraging. All right. Good news. Um, Thanks, Harry. Um, and this I is not a green screen. Anything to say? I'm talking. Um, real quick about um, Melissa's event. Um, if you hashtag, hashtag stand with Melissa McFadden, um, it should pull up the, um, the event, uh, the event flyer. Um, and it's actually for Thursday, October the 22nd from four to six um, in front of a headquarters. Um, interestingly, probably even a little ironically, it's on October the 22nd, which is 022, um, which is the day across the nation that we stand up, show up, and do actions for police brutality. Right. You're right. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a coincidence to me. That's right. like a good day to do it. All right. right. Yeah, don't look Thanks, at Adrian, and congratulations again. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I mistakenly put that in as the 15th, but it's the 22nd, but I'll send out the correct information after the salon. All right, now let's just say hi to everybody that we haven't heard from yet. There is Mary Jane Borden. Hi, Mary Jane. Hey, but she's last hi. year's Libby Award winner. There's Mary Jane Borden. Welcome. And there's Cliff Arnebeck. He was a, a Libby Award winner when? Back in the 2005, maybe? Something like that. Cliff and Sibley. <laughs> hey, Cliff. I don't it's, know if they can uh, talk. Stuart and Margaret. And there's Margaret and Stewart, longtime election integrity activist. Activists, Thank yes. you very much for all your work. And is that Lasker? And there's, is that John Lasker? I can't see him. Oh, there's yeah, John Lasker. Who wrote a really nice article on Adrian Hood. And there's Cliff. There's Cliff. Yeah. Cliff. I need to say Cliff. All right. The, the famous attorney of record who helped Bob sue Must to overturn Bush. the 2004 election. And there's Tekla. Can you say hi, Tekla? Hi, Tekla. She's hi, waving. Tekla. Margaret and Stewart. Okay. Yeah. Tekla. Probably muted. Ryan Curtis still doing his show. There's Cru yeah. Crusoe uh, green screening or out, out in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, out in the wilderness. So maybe he's out in the wilderness. There's it's, Sandy Bolzinius. I don't know here. if you can talk now. You're Libby. You're a past Libby Award Is winner. She muted? And Tim Chavez, I, we should give a shout out to Tim for keeping WGRN Community Radio on the air, because if it wasn't for Tim, we wouldn't have a radio station right now. All right. Why? Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Tim. And yeah. Phil Fry, how great to see Phil Fry. Another uh, legendary election integrity activist, Phil Fry. Uh, Can you say anything, Phil? Maybe not. But we see his little name sticking up there, Phil and his well, wife. Mother Phil, did you have another statement you want to make? Yeah, yeah, real quick. I didn't want to miss Harvey's photograph. I want you to see him in here, too. The other way. Oh, oh yeah, look at got, the bangs. There's got, Harvey. <laughs> it, 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 the Jewish Bobby <laughs> Sherman. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that, Joe. Uh, 1994. Let's do yeah, a shout out. To, we, we did a shout out to Kathy Cowanbecker, but her husband Paul has been taking pictures at every single event that's happened, like in 2020, and posting them on Facebook. And prior to that, letting us use them for the free press, letting them use them in the book that Bob's writing about hate groups in Ohio. Sadly, um, he was at a rally where there was a lot of hate groups, but the pictures turned out good, so they'll be put used in that book. Thank you very much, Paul Becker. Thank you, Paul. And there's Connie Hammond. Hi, Connie. 
I don't, we haven't seen your face, but that's a great picture of you. Probably from a, uh, a JV's, wow, there's and somebody on someone top of on Steve's head. Steve's head, if you can see it. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Connie mixed oh. growing out of your head. <laughs> Hi, everyone. That was weird. <laughs> And then we got Lynn Mix Mystic Healer, which I don't know if we've ever met, but we certainly have corresponded with her over chat and email. And Felina, did you have something to say? Usually you got something to, to say. Bye. Oh, bye, Adrian. Thanks for being here. Bye. Job, Thanks, Adrian. Uh, do, I, do I have something to say about this? Any, anything. Uh, let's see. Um, uh. Let's see, uh, Angela Walker is about to do an interview with the ADOS group that's been kicking up a lot of dust online. It's Who's been, Angela Walker? She's the VP candidate for the Green Party. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So she, uh, she'll she be talking about reparations tomorrow. So okay. that'll be great. Do you want to send me that information so I can send it out? Uh, sure. Miss Brian? Yeah, all of a sudden, Brian. Brian. You? Uh, it's, it's Brian Piccolo. He's growing out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> Does Brian yeah. know who Brian Piccolo is? That's a little before his time, I think. No, Gail but uh, Gail, Gail Sayers just died, so That's yeah. Right. Everyone oh, knows who Brian I, for, I forgot you're such a football fan. You know everything. But I, but I have seen the movie. <laughs> the uh, Brian's song. I used to be able to play that on the With, piano. Um, Billy D. Williams and um, what's his name? James Conn. James Conn. James yeah, James that Gunn. guy. Oh, okay. And we didn't say hi to Kevin Keith. I'm not sure we've met, but hello, Kevin Keith. Looks like his lights are almost completely out. Maybe that's the way he likes to be he's seen. In, he's now in Chicago. He used to be in Columbus. Kevin, but he's Kevin if you're talking, oh, yeah. if you're talking, you're muted. Stealth man. Did you say something? No, I'm just saying he used to be in Columbus. Now he's in Chicago. Oh, you know Kevin Keith? Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome, Kevin Keith. Sorry, we can't hear you for some reason. Hi, Araya. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I know she. She probably. She probably has like a vegan. Uh, masterpiece to whip up in her kitchen, her tiny little kitchen. <laughs> oh, hopefully, that would sound delicious. Well, do, if anybody's got any more announcements, this is the time. Otherwise, we're going to wrap it up and close it down. And, and uh, yeah, vote. Yeah, vote. Yeah, vote, vote early on and, and, and the December and the December salon will be December twelfth, right after these guys come to Columbus and beat. The suck eyes. No. All right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Michigan Victory Party, oh, December well. Salon. I oh, mean, well. that, that'll get you a police beating in Columbus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, I, well, well, hopefully, well, hopefully, if she too passes, then I can be protected. <laughs> I, I'm so happy you vision future. Yes. Uh, let's yes. Get, let's get to pass the elections first. Yeah. Ryan. Yes. Vote. I, I just all right, all your registered friends to vote. Vote, vote, vote. Clemson's vote. try to get my cat. Right. Yeah, vote. Otherwise, Civil War Two slash World War Three begins. On oh, that may happen either way, but vote, vote, vote. So lovely. I mean, we saw what happened in the like this night. Week, Governor of Michigan. I mean, yeah. There. Hey, we got. Four aspects of Columbus that have made national. Our bribery case, our ballot fuck upness, or cluster fuck, as they say. <laughs> we got uh, the Nazis that planned in Dublin, Ohio. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And what the fuck joke is going on? Okay, well, let's the say Daily Stormer guy. Isn't the guy that runs the Daily Stormer, um, Worthington, Worthington yeah. or Dublin? Yeah. Yeah. Worthington. Yes. Yeah, and then um, and, and the guy and, that, the, and the fly's best friend uh, is coming to the northwest side on Monday afternoon. 
Oh, Mike Pence? Oh, yes. Oh. Going to Saturday. I, I, I know, but if, if you looked real close, the fly kept saying, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> throwing a bucket of water on him so his uh, microcircuit short out. He's a cyborg vice president. I mean, and, uh, there's a great news about that. Good. All right. Well, I think we're going to well, sign off. Well. It's good to see y'all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And wow. yeah. He and said, then uh, Rasmus Radio debuts on WCRS tomorrow afternoon at 2. Okay, grassroots radio. Yeah, we took we we took another one of WGRN's. Hit. Oh, Cut Carolyn Harding show. Yes, oh, we're, we're, we're repeating it on WCRS starting tomorrow at two. Good. Good yeah. to know. So, did you have something to say? I saw you. Me? Yeah. Oh, thank you, everybody, and uh, please vote. Thank you. All right. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bob and I are saying goodnight. Bye. 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 We can't afford to move to Canada. <laughs> See you, Joe. <laughs> See you, Steve. Bye. I'm gonna... Bye. Or join or join a militia to overthrow Trump. But yeah, go blue. <laughs>